Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, everybody's doing well. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to focus on my other project. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about my project in Spain. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, my project in California, uh, Mura Vineyards. Um, but uh, previous to that, uh, talk a little bit about the history of wine in the United States, and then talk a little bit about uh, history of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in California, and how things uh, began and how we've come to, uh, to today. So the United States is the fourth largest producer of wine in the world. And California with its 600, almost 640,000 acres is responsible for 90% of the production of the country. It was uh, Spanish Franciscan monks who first produced wine in California at the Mission San Juan Capistrano in Southern California in, in the year 1783. But it was a very colorful personality. The Count Agustin Horasi, who later founded uh, Buena Vista Winery, which still exists, and was born in Hungary, who is generally recognized as the father of California wine. Because in 1861, he was commissioned by the governor of California to go to Europe and report on the vineyards there. And he returned with more than 100,000 wine cuttings of more than 400 different varieties. And that's mostly what was what is planted today was from those 100,000 cuttings. Um, as with most wine regions around the world, California was no stranger to the slowdown in the wine industry caused by phylloxera in the late 1800s. We talked about that, that root louse that destroyed um, all the vineyards in Europe. Um, and then followed by, obvious, of course, World War I, Prohibition, the Great Depression, and, uh, and World War II. It was after World War II when the Gallo brothers out of Modesto began producing cheap table wine for American soldiers who had acquired a taste of wine uh, in Europe that Americans began to enjoy wine more regularly. Um, so they really were the pillars that uh, the fine wine industry eventually uh, grew out of. The naming system in the United States began in 1981. And uh, Napa Valley received the second AVA. So American Viticultural Appellation, that's the system of naming that we have in this country. Interestingly, Augusta, Missouri received the first AVA uh, appellation in, in this country. So the American system of appellation is based on truth and labeling rather than the much more restrictive appellations in Europe. In Europe, the government controls what varieties you can plant where, how much yield you can get, winemaking methods, um, et cetera. So it's very restricted. In other words, if you're in Bordeaux, you can't plant Syrah because you can only plant Syrah in the, in the Rhone Valley and in Southern uh, France. If you plant, Syrah in Bordeaux, it cannot be labeled as Bordeaux. It has to be labeled as table wine. So that's very different from the system, the Appalachian system that we have in this country. Like I mentioned, the government only cares about two things. Like I mentioned, truth and labeling. That means whatever you put on the label is true. So if you say Napa Valley on the label, then 85% of the wine has to be from Napa Valley. If you put a variety, say Cabernet Sauvignon on the label, 
75% of the wine must be made from Cabernet. And if you put a single vineyard, then 95% of the wine must be made from grapes that originate in that property. Likewise, if you say 2017, then 95% of the wine must come from the harvest of 2017. So the government doesn't care if with, say, Cabernet. As long as you put 75% of Cabernet, the other 25% can be whatever you like. If you happen to want to put Chenin Blanc in your Cabernet, go for it. Um, there is no restriction of any kind in that sense. Um, the other part that uh, our government cares about is taxes. Um, so very important if your wine has under 14% alcohol or over 14% alcohol. If it, because the tax rate for wine that has over 14% alcohol is much, uh, much heavier, much higher than under 14% alcohol. So those are, the, those are the two things, alcohol and that what you say on the label is true. Um, so now talking about Mura and my project. So um, my last name, Kamiji, people don't know how to pronounce it. They say Kamijai, Kamji. They think it's Japanese until they meet me and I don't happen to look like a person of Japanese descent. Um, it's actually Greek Cypriot. So early on, I came to terms with the fact that this was uh, a lousy name for a winery and I came up with this name Mura. So Mura is derived from Don Eduardo Mura, the breeder of the most famous fighting bulls in Spain. I grew up in Spain of a Spanish mother um, and my grandfather was a huge bullfighting aficionado and counted amongst his closest friends, some of Spain's most famous bullfighters. So in his honor, for the Spanish, it's a legendary name. You say the word Mura to any man, woman, or child, and they'll say the fighting bulls. So how I got into making wine, because uh, for many years, I was a sommelier. Um, I... Uh, was a sommelier with the Ritz-Carlton from the late 80s to the late 90s. Uh, first in Laguna Niguel in Southern California, and then in San Francisco, where I ran the wine program for the company. Um, and uh, in, uh, in 1995, along with some friends, some Ritz, some, some other chefs from other restaurants, we decided that it would be a great experience since we were only an hour away from Napa to make some wine and uh, just get our hands dirty and understand how wine was made. So in 1995, um, I uh, got some Cabernet grapes from Augustin Huneos, who at that time was developing one a vineyard that has become one of the most iconic vineyards in uh, Napa Valley, Quintessa. Uh, and we made a Cabernet from uh, six barrels of Cabernet from Quintessa. So a barrel of wine, to give you an idea, makes about um, uh, 25 cases of wine. So, and a ton of grapes makes a, a little, about 60 cases of wine. So we got two and a half tons of grapes, made about uh, six barrels, so about 150 cases uh, of wine. It was a great experience. And the year after, we said, well, let's do it again, but let's do it with another variety. And um, I said, well, why not Pinot Noir? Um, as we all love Pinot Noir, especially those of us uh, in the restaurant industry. And uh, um, I... Uh, then, as it still holds true today, tough to find great Pinot, well, not just in California, but anywhere. Um, but I finally convinced uh, a good friend, uh, Dr. Michelle Soggs, who was the head of Rotor Estate up in Mendocino. And he says, look, Emmanuel, I'm not selling a single grape this year. I need everything I can get, but I like your project. I'll figure out a way to get you a ton of grapes. 
And um, I said, well, a ton, it's such a small amount, I'm just gonna do it myself. So in 1996, uh, I made a, a ton of, uh, of Pinot Noir from the Rotor Estate Vineyard. And then came the summer of 97, time to divvy out uh, the cab that we had made. Uh, there were originally seven of us in the project. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, I had 125 cases of wine in my very small uh, San Francisco apartment and thought, what the hell am I gonna do with all this stuff? Um, but word got around town pretty quickly that I had made some wine. At that time, I was the first somewhere in this country to have commercially made wine. And soon I was getting calls from some of the top Psalms in San Francisco. I said, hey, I heard you made some wine. Can, can I taste it? I said, sure. Why don't you come over to uh, my apartment after the shift and I'll pop open a couple bottles and they would come over and, hey, this stuff's pretty good. Can I get some for the restaurant? And only too happy to get rid of some of it. Um, and the next day, I'd take a couple of cases back to a restaurant, grab a check, totally illegal, no licenses of any kind. Um, but they're the ones that really gave me the impetus to go forward and keep doing this. And I always kind of say that 1998 is our first commercial vintage. And you're commercial in the wine business when your friends and family don't drink most of what you make and you actually have something left over to sell. But after that harvest in, uh, in 1998, I realized that it was like having two full-time jobs. It wasn't fair to the wine and it wasn't fair to the Ritz-Carlton who had been a huge supporter of, uh, of the project from the, from the get-go. So right before the harvest of 99, I left the Ritz and left the, the Psalm profession to devote myself to this new challenge and, uh, and created Muir and really focused on Mura full time. So Mura today, uh, I make a Chardonnay, um, which you have, I believe you have in front of you, and we make four Pinots. Um, one is uh, a San Lucia Highland Pinot. We'll talk more about the San Lucia Highlands in a minute. And then three single vineyard Pinots. And really the way I put the program together is I thought, okay, as a, a psalm and a buyer for almost 20 years of California wine, what did I think were the best Pinot vineyards in California? Um, and within each of those regions, what was the vineyard in that particular place? So today we have three single vineyards, one from the Anderson Valley, which you're gonna be tasting, another from Sonoma, uh, the Rocchioli Vineyard from the Russian River Valley, and then from the Pisoni Vineyard in the San Lucia Highlands. Um, but before we uh, get talking more about Pinot Noir, uh, let's talk a little bit about Chardonnay. Um, so Chardonnay, um, which uh, originally comes from Burgundy in France, um, is believed to be a cross of Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, and an almost extinct white variety called Gouaise Blanc, uh, when the Romans ruled the countries we now know as France and Germany. Uh, Today, Chardonnay is the fifth most planted grape variety in the world. It was first planted in California in uh, 1882 by Charles Wetmore in the Livermore Valley, east of San Francisco. But it wasn't until the 1930s that it began to be bottled as a varietal, as Chardonnay, and for many years incorrectly labeled as Pinot Chardonnay, because it was thought to belong to the Pinot family, but later on found out that it wasn't. Um, interestingly enough, in the 1960s, in the early 60s, there were only 300 acres planted to California Chardonnay. It, and uh, today, to give you a comparison, today there are 93,000 acres planted in California. 
So in that 60 year span, we've gone from 300 acres to 93,000 acres of Chardonnay in California. And why this transformation? And you can really pinpoint the whole growth of Chardonnay in California to a very famous event called the Paris Tasting of 1976. And the Paris Tasting, which was covered by Time Magazine and actually ended up being the cover of Time Magazine um, in, 1970, in one of the months of 1976, was um, an Englishman called Stephen Spurrier that had a, a, one of the best wine shops in Paris who had been to California and, and developed a fondness for California wines. Well, he put together a blind tasting that pitted some of the best California Chardonnays against some of the best California, uh, French white burgundies and some of the best Bordeaux against some of the best uh, California Cabernets of the time. Well, uh, the Chardonnay portion was won by a 1973 Chateau Montalina Chardonnay made by Mike Gergich, who went on to uh, establish Gergich Hills, uh, that bested uh, a great white burgundy, a Merceau Chams by Rouleau. Um, and, and actually, the Cabernet or red wine section was won by a 1972 Stag Sleep Wine Cellars Cabernet that beat out a 1970 Chateau Mouton Rothschild. So this kind of transformed, this put California on the world wine map as a great wine region for the first time. Um, now the Chardonnay that uh, you're gonna be tasting today, um, that's uh, from the Hudson Ranch. And the Hudson Ranch was established by a Texan, Lee Hudson, in 1981 and is in the south is uh, in the Carneros region of southern Napa Valley. So I'm going to just take a second to point out so map of California, right? And you'll see that most of the wine regions in California are very close to the Pacific Ocean because it's that cooling trend from the Pacific Ocean that makes it ideal for to make premium wine. Once you get away from the coast, it gets a lot warmer, and there the kind of wines that you make are good, but more table wines than actually premium wines. So if we look at California and the wines we're gonna be tasting today, so here's San Francisco, San Francisco Bay, Here's Napa, right here, Sonoma, Mendocino. Then you come to Monterey County, Paso Robles, and then we go into Santa Barbara County, where we have Santa Maria Valley and Santa Ynez Valley. This area that stretches from Ventura or Santa Barbara all the way to San Francisco, is called the Central Coast. That's what we refer to as the Central Coast of California. And then Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake County, that would be called the North Coast of, of California. So the Carneros region um, is stretches along the southern part of Napa and the southern part of Sonoma, right here. So it covers both counties, and it is influenced by the wind that comes through the San Francisco uh, Bay and goes into the San Pablo Bay. And those winds, which are very cold, have a cooling effect on Southern Napa. So if we're in Southern Napa, this is about 15 degrees cooler than 28 miles north at the northernmost part of Napa in the town of Calistoga to give you just in 28 miles, it's 15 degrees cooler in the Carneros region. And that's what makes it ideal for especially Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which are grapes that like very cool climates. Um, so 
Uh, Lee Hudson established, like I mentioned, established the Hudson Vineyard in 1981. And along with its close neighbor, the Hyde Vineyard, is considered to be the, these are the, considered to be the two finest Chardonnay properties in Napa Valley and two of the top five Chardonnay properties in California. It's a 2,000 acre property of which about 200 are plant, 200 acres are planted to vines of which 90 of those 200 acres are Chardonnay. So you have some of the most famous Chardonnay producers in California make wine from the Hudson Vineyard. So wineries like Kistler, Consgard, Aubert, Ramey are some of the renowned producers that make Chardonnay from this property. We began making Chardonnay from this property in 2016. So the wine that you have in front of you is the second vintage, the 2017, of which we made just 12 barrels of, or around 240 cases of that. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's this, uh, this Chardonnay that uh, you, have, uh, you have in front of you. So um, we make the Chardonnay in, a, what would I say, a very Burgundian style. Um, so what does that mean? First of all, like all of our wines, we don't uh, start fermentation by adding yeast, uh, yeast that you can get in a lab or cultured yeast. We let the natural yeast that exists on the grape skins and leave them to start the fermentation on their own. So we crush the grapes and then the natural yeast that exists on the grapes starts the fermentation. Um, that's a process that a lot of smaller premium wineries use. Um, the difference between culture or lab yeast and what we call wild or native or indigenous yeast is that with, with lab yeast, you know exactly what's going to happen, what flavor they're going to add to the fermentation, to the wine, and how long it's going to be. So typically, uh, a fermentation with lab yeast will take about 10 to 20 days. Now, with native or wild yeast, sometimes it takes two or three weeks, and we've had fermentations that have lasted nine months. So when you're a big commercial winery, you can't have that discrepancy um, because it's very tough. You have to be on top of every single barrel and monitor every single barrel to make sure that the fermentations are taking place and that nothing is going wrong. Um, also, all, all the wine that, uh, all our Chardonnay is barrel fermented um, and then spends about almost a year in barrels, all French, mostly new, um, and then is bottled unfiltered. So we don't like filtering our wines because filtering, um, well, filtering, yes, makes the wine very clear and very bright, which if you're a commercial winery, make hundreds of thousands of cases, that's very important but it also strips some of the character, some of the fruit of the wine. So we're not quite as concerned because obviously we only make 240 cases. If the wine isn't completely bright and clear, that if it has some sediment that doesn't bother us because we feel it makes for a better wine. Another difference when you're using native yeast versus lab yeast, Typically, the wine made from native yeast tends to have another layer of complexity. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we would call a, a Burgundian or a very non-interventionist way where we, where we really manipulate the wine as little as possible um, so that it really becomes a representation of what we think is a very special place. Um, so, did, is everybody tasting uh, the Chardonnay? Yeah. 
Please drink it all as I didn't make very much of it. Um, so, um, typical, you know, what, what makes Hudson so special? And, you know, when we think of California Chardonnay, we tend to think of, and if you just, and if I just describe the wine is, gosh, it's barrel fermented, spends a year in barrel, has all new barrels. Um, you think, God, this is gonna be a big oaky uh, bomb. And when you taste the wine, yes, you feel the wood, but you also feel like this brightness that and this sense of minerality that keeps the wine bright and lively on its feet. Um, and that's unusual for California Chardonnay to have that brightness and that sense of minerality. Um, and that's what, that's what made Hudson such a, a special vineyard. Does anybody have a question for Daniel? I'm sorry? I was asking if they had a question for you. Not yet. At any point, feel free to interrupt. So, oh, I, so <laughs> I know I don't have to tell that to Jennifer. So, um, but uh, so now, um, you know, and this kind of Chardonnay uh, that goes great with richer foods, so scallops or uh, lobster or those beautiful Key West pink shrimps that you guys get out there. This is the kind of wine that uh, would match very, very well with that kind of food. Because it has enough of that, you know, pear and tropical character, but yet still to match the sweetness of lobster or shrimp or scallops, but yet enough acidity to, to really stand up to uh, the taste of those, uh, of those foods. So now we'll move on and, and talk a little bit about Pinot Noir and uh, um, its history. So Pinot is a very old variety. Records go back to the year 50 before the birth of Christ. Um, and it was either the Romans that brought it to Burgundy from Turkey or Persia, or it was native to the region. Not, it's never been ascertained whether it was already there or it was the Romans who brought a number of varieties throughout their empire. Uh, we talked about Spain and, and certainly to France. Um, they brought a number of varieties from the Middle East with them. Um, so in California, the first 100% Pinot Noir bottling was by Martin Ray in 1945. And the first Burgundian type of state in California. So when you're saying Burgundian type of state, uh, a winery that focused solely on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir was founded in 1953 by a former ambassador to, uh, to Italy named Sellerbach, and he called uh, the winery Hansel, uh, which still exists in Sonoma to this day and, and makes wonderful Chardonnay and Pinot Noir still to this day. But Pinot did not become a hot commodity in California till 1981. And that happened when a little tiny winery in, in, in a garage called Hacienda del Rio that in 1984 had to change their name because they were sued by another Sonoma winery that was just called Hacienda that still exists today. So in 1984, Hacienda del Rio became Williams and Celia. And that was the first time that people went, wow, Pinot Noir in California, it can be incredible. And it was the first winery to achieve a cult status. And to this day, uh, the Pinots of Williamson Solium are very sought after um, and extraordinarily expensive. So 
Uh, and the name Williams and Selium, well, uh, Williams was Bert Williams and Selium was Ed Selium. Bert made the wine and Ed sold it. Um, and at first they were just home winemakers. Bert wor worked in a printing uh, shop for a San Francisco newspaper. Um, and then uh, once uh, his wine exploded on the scene, he left that to dedicate himself uh, to making wine up in the Russian River Valley. Um, and uh, the wine that you're, the first Pinot that you are going to have today has a very strong lineage to Bert because after he sold uh, uh, his share of Williams and Selium in 1997, he bought a property in the Anderson Valley. And that's that property is Morning Dew Ranch. And in 1998, he planted it with 12 acres. So I got to know Bert very well because we have a mutual Spanish friend. And uh, as soon as I found out that Bert had, uh, was starting a property in the Anderson Valley, in Mendocino, um, I uh, desperately wanted to get grapes from him because for me, the Anderson Valley, and we talked, uh, we mentioned it earlier. So the Anderson Valley is in Mendocino. It's in the Southern part of Mendocino County. And the Anderson Valley is the coolest viticultural area in California. So, the Pinot Noirs that come from the Anderson Valley are the most Burgundian-like. What does that mean? They tend to have less alcohol. They tend to be much more um, aromatic um, versus, well, you're going to have the opposite end of the spectrum uh, when you taste the Pisoni next. So to me, they're the most elegant of the Pinot Noirs uh, that we make in California. So I finally convinced Bert to sell us some fruit in the year 2006. And so out of those 12 acres, we get two acres worth of fruit. Um, and let's go ahead and taste that Morning Dew Ranch. Uh, unfortunately, Bert passed away this last year. So one of the great legends and one of the great guys in, in California wine history uh, passed away. But uh, the legacy that he left behind, I mean, any of us who make Pinot Noir owe a great uh, gratitude to Bert because he's the one that paved the way for, for Pinot in, in California. So Morning Dew is, um, is uh, a site on a ridge right above uh, the Anderson Valley, one of the most beautiful sites in all of California. Um, but it's a very low yielding site, uh, which we love because the lower the yield, the more intense the fruit. Um, so out of those two acres, we typically get about a ton, a ton and a quarter per acre. So vineyards, well, we, I think I mentioned this last time. So a vineyard like Opus One, a great cab vineyard in Napa, will get four to five tons an acre. So you can imagine here that uh, one ton an acre, that's even under the standard for the top Burgundy vineyards um, in France. So. Um, although we make very little of this wine, I think we made about 160 cases uh, in 2016. Uh, this is one of uh, really the favorite wines uh, at the winery and uh, a tribute to, to this great man who, uh, who planted this vineyard there. I have a um, question about that. So yes. um, if I remember correctly, you used to carry Williams Ranch, right? Which was him. Right. It was, we, two, it was two men, though. So, no. Um, well, when he sold Williams and Selium, both he and Ed Selium sold it, and he went out on his own. So I initially called the vineyard. Uh, well, every time I said, 
morning dew. I kept saying Mountain Dew. Me too. So um, I asked Bert if instead I could call it Williams Ranch because he had found the property, he planted it, and he said, sure. But uh, a few years ago, he sold uh, the property um, and the new owner uh, asked us if we would call it by the name of the property, the name that everybody, actually Williams and Salyum makes a Morning Dew Ranch also. Um, so they bought grapes from, they and they continue to buy grapes from, from this property. Um, so then we, ch in 2016, I started calling it um, Morning Dew Ranch uh, because the new owners asked us if we wouldn't mind doing that. So that, you know, uh, to propagate the name, to really uh, elevate the status of the name and get it out there more. Um, so the bottle, we actually have some bottles of Williams Ranch here. We bought it last year when I first got here. So okay. those would be the same place then? That, that is the same place. It's okay. exactly the same wine. Yeah. Cool. So. Right. Back to you. Okay. So um, then uh, let's talk a little bit about Pisoni. Uh, so Pisoni is... Uh, quite an extraordinary story. And, but first I'll tell you where it comes from. And we talked about the San Lucia Highlands. So the San Lucia Highlands are in Monterey County in the Salinas Valley. And you all know about the Salinas Valley, whether you realize it or not, because if you've ever eaten lettuce, broccoli, asparagus, or artichokes in this country, 90% of it comes from the Salinas Valley. But on the western side of the Salinas Valley, right here, right very close on the other side of these little highlands from Monterey, what separates the Salinas Valley from the Pacific Ocean, is these highlands, which are about 20 miles long and about one mile wide. And, um, there, there's where the next wine comes from. And it was one man that really put this region on the map. And that guy's name is Gary Pisoni. So Gary is one of the most colorful characters in the business. And thank God that we have guys like Gary in the business so that we don't take each other too seriously. Um, because let's just say that Gary had a lot of fun in the 60s and still has a lot of fun. And we'll leave it at that. But um, in the late 70s, uh, growing up in the region, most of his friends uh, were involved in the, in the wine business, in the planting of mostly what was in, uh, in Monterey, Chardonnay and, and uh, Pinot Noir, because Monterey is a cooler region um and uh so he decided in uh 1981 to go to burgundy and find out more about chardonnay and pinot noir the birthplace of chardonnay and pinot noir and uh it was in february and he happened to be walking by one of the most famous vineyards uh and what many of us feel is probably the greatest Pinot Noir property in the world, uh, a, a vineyard called Latash. So if you want to buy a bottle of Latash from a recent vintage, get ready to fork out about three grand. Um, and that's per bottle. Never mind if you want to go to uh, an, older uh, an older vintage. So one of the most expensive and sought after wines in the world. So they had just pruned at Latosh and Gary w was walking by the vineyard and saw all these vine cuttings on the floor, on the ground. And he didn't think anybody would mind if he availed himself of some of those cuttings. Um, so we, he, it's what we call a suitcase clone of Pinot Noir because the FDA frowns upon bringing uh, 
plant material into this country unannounced. Um, so we don't like using smuggled because it's such an ugly word. So Gary brought in these cuttings, unbeknownst to anyone, and planted them on this old cattle ranch that his father had bought from a friend who uh, was in uh, financial straits. And basically, uh, Gary's father was a, a big grower of vegetables in the valley. And basically, this ranch was rented out to graze cattle, barely able to pay the taxes on the land. And so when Gary asked his father if he could plant these cuttings that he had brought from France on this property, his father was only too happy to finally have his, father, his son do something with his life. Well, he hit pay dirt, that one in a million where you plant the right clone of Pinot Noir in the right place. Because Pinot Noir is the most difficult grape variety to grow uh, most difficult wine to make in a winery and the most difficult grape to grow. It's very climate sensitive, it's very soil sensitive, and it's very disease prone. Um, so it's the ultimate challenge out in the vineyard and out in the winery. That's why Pinot Noir only grows well in just a few places on this planet. So you have Burgundy, its birthplace, the Willamette Valley in Oregon, the coastal areas of California and the South Island of New Zealand in a region called Central Otago. As opposed to Cabernet, the opposite. Cabernet is easy to grow, it grows really well. So you have great Cabernet in France, you even have some great Cabernet in Spain, in Italy you have Sasakaya, in Australia you have fabulous Cabernets, uh, South Africa, Argentina, Chile, uh, obviously California, Washington State. And that's because it's the opposite. Uh, it's, uh, it's not as soil or climate sensitive. It grows very well. It also yields a lot more. On top of the fact that Pinot Noir is difficult to grow, it's also a low yielder. Um, but when it does grow, it makes magical wine. So we started, I started hearing, uh, or, or Psalms in San Francisco started hearing about this incredible Pinot Noir out of Monterey in all places in around the mid 90s. And because back then, if you ask a Psalm about Pinot Noir from Monterey, they say, well, good, good, you know, good $15, $20 retail Pinot, good for the money, but nothing to write home about. And all of a sudden we started tasting a few Pinots uh, from this vineyard and we had never tasted a wine with this kind of concentration and power, not just in California, but of any Pinot in the world with this, with this kind of intensity and concentration. So uh, today, um, it has become probably the most renowned Pinot Vineyard in California. The most expensive Pinot Noir grapes in California come from this vineyard. There's about 35 acres planted, of which 30 are Pinot. There's about 10 of us that get Pinot from this vineyard. So people like Patson Hall, uh, Costa Brown, Siduri, uh, so kind of the who's who of great Pinot makers. And we're fortunate to get about uh, four acres worth. This is the, the one you're trying. So the opposite spectrum of, 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 Will, of the Morning Dew or Williams. So if we talk about Williams, we talk about beautiful, bright, red fruit, aromatic, alcohol of about 13%. We go to Pisoni, it's the opposite. So here you have more black fruit, more tannin, uh, alcohol is closer to 14 and a half percent. So kind of, I call it like the difference between elegance and power. Which is better? Well, that depends on what you prefer. Qualitatively, we think that they're on par. Stylistically, they're very different and hence why we make them. 
um, we typically make about 450 cases a year from uh, Pisoni. Um, but 2015 was the fourth drought year in a row. And that's where we really felt that the, 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 the loss of fruit. So instead of about 450 cases uh, that we usually make out of the four acres that we get, we only made 280 cases. So a dramatic, about a 40% loss in fruit because of the drought years that had uh, existed previously in, in California. And so that, uh, any questions? God, you're all so well behaved. <laughs> Got to drink a little more. Um, but uh, I have a question for you. Uh huh. We had someone ask here uh, in between the two wines and how different they are in flavor. Would you say that that's mainly because of the soil and the um, between the, the two regions? Yes, so that, that, that's, a great, that's a great question. So the difference, uh, so when, when we talk, when we talk about, you know, when, when we talk about Cabernet, we talk about the fruit. When somebody's talking about Cabernet, it's about Cabernet. It's about the fruit that you get out of Cabernet. When you talk about Pinot, you talk about the place. Pinot varies dramatically from place to place because it is so soil and climate sensitive. So it changes dramatically in just a few miles uh, from one place to another. And so, yes, the difference that we have because we make the wines in a similar way. Uh, we treat the wines not identical, because we don't have a cookie cutter formula, but fairly similar. So the difference in the two wines is absolutely because of the soil and climate of these two places. No other grape re reflects where it comes from as much as Pinot Noir. So that's a that's a great thing. So uh, another question I had for you was between the two wines, how different of a time frame was there between uh, with the bottling? You know, no, 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 no not very different. Um, so. We, we pick, because Pistoni, even though Monterey is still a cool region, we typically pick, uh, and, and, and here's where you kind of get an idea of how climate changes things. So we pick Pistoni on the first, around the first week of September. During harvest, when grapes are maturing, we, we kind of, we kind of think, not think, we know that typical alcohol goes up about 1% every week as, as grapes mature with harvest. So when we pick Pisoni at, at the beginning of September, it has about 14.5% alcohol. Now we pick Williams three weeks later. So you would think, well, if Pistoni has 14.5% alcohol, Williams should have about 17% alcohol. Well, it actually only has 13%. And that reflects how much cooler it is in Mendocino relative to Monterey, that even though it's had three more weeks of staying out uh, on, on the vineyards, it actually has less percent alcohol than Pistoni. So it makes uh, where, where you where you grow grapes and the temperature apart from the soil makes a dramatic difference in in the final wine. Any 
And one, one thing, so, so with Pino like Williams, I would serve lighter fare, like chicken, quail, pork, with something like Sony, I would serve poultry that's more flavorful. So, so things like pheasant, duck, goose, some, or, or a stronger style stew, uh, some things with mushrooms or uh, anything with stronger flavors like truffles. Um, so important to note that the two wines go, even though they're Pinot Noirs, they go with kind of very different things. The question is, uh, what kind of an earth smell would you really pull out of the Pisoni wine? Well, out of Pisoni, out of Pisoni um, so uh, the, the main smells that I get out of Pisoni are more black fruit, so blackberry, black plums, and then dried herbs. Um, kind of, that's kind of the smells that I get out of Pisoni. If I'm, uh, I'm looking at Williams, I get more bright fruit. So strawberries, red cherries, uh, red plums versus black plums, that kind of, that kind of. So more red rather than black. And obviously the Pisoni has more body because it has higher alcohol. And alcohol is what gives wine body. Not, you know, that is the main element that gives wine richness and fullness. So the Pisoni is definitely gonna be a bigger, fuller wine. It's also gonna be more tannic. Uh, tannic uh, or tannin, that, that dry, chalky type of acid that that wine has. And Pisoni definitely has more of that than the Williams. Um, we got Carla. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we I got Carla for those scent boxes. So we have a scent box here with 88 cents in it. So we are kind of working with the team to help them identify aromas, to help them identify flavors in the wine. So that's why Chanel was asking those questions about the herbs, the dry herbs. No. Um, and in and, and, and terms of dried herbs, I, I, I kind of get tired of Days on the herbs that you get mostly out of out of Pisoni, but you know, different people pick up different things. You know, um, I think you know, especially important when you're matching wine to food, is above all you want to focus on just a couple of things. Number one is the the dish, the dish itself, is it, is it a more delicate dish, therefore a more delicate wine? But in terms of flavor, it's not actually, let's, let's say, let, let's say, let's just take chicken. Um, the, the most prevalent flavor is not necessarily the meat itself. The most prevalent flavor in a dish is typically the sauce or the spices that it's flavored with. And that's what you've got to match in the wine. So you want to match the body of the wine to the intensity of the meat, but then you want to match the flavor of the wine to the, the end flavor of that dish, which is the sauce or the spices used. That, that's, that's the most important thing in wine and food matching. Those are the two key elements. And you also want, especially, you want a wine, when you're having it with food, you, you have to have a wine that has good acid. Because acid is that component in wine that cleanses your palate and prepares you for the next morsel. If a wine doesn't have much acid, then you will not taste you will not taste the flavor. 
it, your, your, your tongue just becomes numb because it, it can't, it, it isn't refreshed. And that's, that's what acid does in a wine. So big, typically, you know, big alcoholic wines, when you get those 16% Napa Cat or, or, you know, Zinfandels, those are not very good fruit wines because they, they don't, first of all, they tend to overpower food and because higher alcohol wines have less acid than lower alcohol wines, then you, you, your kind of tongue becomes numb to new flavors. Makes sense? So what would you say the alcohol level is in the personality? What would you say the alcohol level is the percentage? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. What's the alcohol level in the personality compared to the morning dew she's asking? Uh, so the morning dew is about 13% and the Pisoni is about 14.5%. Um, uh, so the, there's going to be more acid in the morning dew. Um, so acid also cuts down the fat in dishes. Um, but there's still, uh, there's still a fair amount of acid in Pisoni. So it, it still works well with a number of dishes, um, but because it is a more intense, powerful wine, it calls for a more intense, powerful dish. So basically, it's more sweet than the wine comes from the food that you're tasting with the wine. Yes? Well, what, 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 I mean, the best way to, to, to really understand is next time, look, you have three wines in front of you, a, a white and two reds from the same variety, but different alcohol levels. Try the, the three wines with the same dish and you'll be amazed at how different things taste when you have the three different wines. It'll make the taste of that dish taste completely different one from another. And that's where you really realize, wow, it really does make a big difference, uh, the wine that you have with a particular dish. Anybody else have questions? No? So, Manuel, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. We're, we're, we're shy today. Actually, they're always shy, quite frankly. <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you all for, for sitting in and listening and uh, always for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.